Okay, now we need to add the USB libraries that we're going to use in the system. This is also done in the pinout diagram, but this is now right at the top of the pinout diagram. So if we go back to our cube environment, and we can reduce the clock section and scroll all the way to the top, we can now see our middlewares, and we want to add the USB mass storage class for our ability to add the audio files to the quad SPI. So that has now brought those into the library as the project as well. So the next area we need to do is the clock configuration. You may have noticed that a red cross has already appeared next to our clock configuration diagram. What we need to now do is correct all the problems that we've currently got because of the periphery that we've selected to make sure our clock tree is functioning correctly. So there's quite a lot that we need to make sure is configured in this. First thing we need to do is make sure our multi-speed internal oscillator is set to 4, kilo, 4 megahertz. Then we need to make sure the main PLL is using our multi-speed internal oscillator. Then we need to configure the PLL to make sure we're getting the correct clock speed that we expect. Then we need to make sure that the output from the PLL clock is what is providing the main system clock. Then we need to make sure that the PLL for SAI is set correctly because this PLL is going to generate our 48 megahertz for our USB. So there's quite a few things to make sure we have configured correctly here in the clock tree. When it's all complete, we should have the main clock tree at 80 megahertz. So H clock needs to be 80 megahertz and our USB clock needs to be 48 megahertz. So let's go back to our cube environment now and select the clock configuration where we have the red X at the moment to tell us there's a problem. Now cube should be able to tell you that there is a problem. So mine here is automatically detected there's some issues and it's asking me do I want to run the automatic clock issue resolver. So I'm going to say yes. So this should hopefully fix all the problems that I had. So H clock is now 80 megahertz and my USB clock is 48 megahertz. Just to make sure and check, my MSI is 4 megahertz MSI is now linked to my PLL as a clock source. My main PLL is now configured correctly. And the PLL clock is now the source of my system clock. So my 80 megahertz path has been correctly resolved automatically by the system. For my USB, so I need to check my PLL SAI. So this has now been resolved to make sure we generate 48 megahertz. And the correct multiplexer now is generating the correct speed for my USB. I think if you check my PowerPoint slides, I think I might be on times 48 divided by four. It doesn't really make a great deal of difference as long as you get 48 megahertz as the output of the clock.
So now we need to go and do some configuration of the actual peripherals so that we set the peripherals up ready to do the part of the application we need. So we need to go into the configuration tab now and the first peripheral we need to configure is the reset and clock control. So in here we need to make sure MSI auto calibration is enabled. So the only thing we need to do in this area is just make sure that that is enabled. So if we go back to our diagram we now go into the configuration tab and we go and open the RCC area. So MSI auto calibration is enabled. So that's fantastic. We don't have to do anything at all there. So we can now OK that screen. So the next one we need to configure is the quad SPI. So in here, there's a few items that we do need to configure. We need to make sure our clock prescaler is configured correctly. The size of our FIFO is correct, configured correctly. And the flash size for the external chip we are using is configured correctly. So we're currently on a 16 megabyte SPI, quad SPI NOR flash attached on our discovery board. So we need to make sure that these parameters now match that chip. So that means we need to put those into the CubeMX. So if I go into my Quad SPI configuration, so my clock prescaler is zero. My FIFO threshold is four. And my flash size is 0x17 so that we are signaling 16 megabytes of memory. So then we apply and OK that screen. So that's our Quad SPI configured now. And the last peripheral we need to configure is the USB. So in here the USB and we need to make sure that the VBUS sensing is disabled. So if we go back to our cube environment, we go into the USB and we need to disable VBUS sensing. And then apply that and OK that. The reason we're disabling the VBUS sensing is because it is not a feature that has been enabled on our discovery board. So we're not disabling it for any specific reason, it's just not available to us on the discovery board. So the libraries that we're bringing in are already pre-written, they're tested already, they've been to the USB.org people, and these are robust libraries that will provide us with all the commands that we need to do a mass storage based application. So now we need to go and configure these middleware libraries. So in back to our configuration again, we now need to look at the middleware and in here we need to change some parameters to match the specific memory chip we have connected on our discovery board. So in the parameter settings tab of the USB libraries, we need to make sure that our packet size for our memory chip is correct. So if we now go into our middleware configuration and parameter settings we need to make sure our packet size is set to 4096 so that information is available from the data sheet of the memory chip we're using 
and we need to disable link power management because again it's not a feature we have available on our discovery board and we can apply that then we move across to device descriptor there's no change needed unless you already have your own vendor ID and product ID so if you had your own vendor ID product ID you can change it now in the device descriptor section but for the sake of our demonstration keep using the ST um, vendor ID and product ID that we already have um, saved in the libraries so that's all the settings we need so now we want to go and generate the code so we want to go into project and generate code and as you saw earlier on we need to generate a name for our project a location for our project and we need to make sure we select the correct tool chain we will be using for our project so I can OK that project generate code so we're going to call this audio player and it's going in my default location where I store all my cube examples and I'm going to leave it as being an e warm project we then need to make sure that we only copy necessary f library files for our project and we want to make sure we generate peripheral initializations of pairs of dot c's and dot h's so we need to make sure we're setting some particular parameters for our file project so if i go into code generation only copy necessary files and generate them as the pairs of dot c's and dot h's keep user code when regenerating is automatically selected so I don't have to worry about that and now we build the project once you've built the project do not open the application yet because we then need to add the application code to the automatically generated files so that we have some software to run when we open the application so we generate our code I already have a folder called audio player on my hard disk so it's warned me that uh, I will overwrite my existing project so I've already run this example uh, previously right so I do not want to open the project so we will close this section and now we want to apply the patch so we're going to add the application code to the template files that our cube MX has just generated so there are four files to add in this section there is the quad SPI dot C and dot H so these are adding all the relevant routines to do our initialization our read and write accesses our block read and writes and our status information so so these two files have got all this application code pre-written for you so that we don't have to sit here and type it all in uh, so it speeds up the process we've also got to add the or overwrite the USB storage interface dot C so again 
there is application code all in here which has been specifically uh, written for the 4k sector size of our target memory device that we're using so all these routines now exist in the new version of the storage if.c and then the final file is a brand new file uh, so this does not get created by the cube mx and this is the parameters of the particular memory chip we have on the discovery board so we need to know everything about the sector size of this particular memory chip so all these files can be found in section 2 of our hands-on zip file and they'll be in the patch folder and it'll be step 1 USB MSC device so if you go and find these four files from this folder then copy them and paste them into where you have just saved your audio player example so if I now go onto my folder so hands on section 2 patch USB MSC device so in my source file there's my two files so I will copy those and I will paste them into my cube demo folder for audio player copy and replace copy and replace I will now go to my dot h files so there's two of those and back to my audio player example and paste those in so only one of them will be a copy and replace the other is a brand new file so now I can go into the eWarm folder and open my project. So I can now open my IAR project. Okay, I want to F7 to build the project. My project is now building. So zero errors, zero warnings. So I need to now project, download, download active application. Okay, so my board is now in a low power mode here, so I need to use the ST-Link utility to connect. So if I launch ST-Link utility, and target connect, so my ST-Link utility can get hold of the device even though it's in a low power mode so I now want to open my binary file that I've just generated so audio player so there's no file there so I need to go and tell IAR to generate my file to right click into the settings output converter generate an additional file binary I'll let the label stay as default so I now need to build again there we go so it's generated the output file and converted it so now I should be able to find 
my file in audio player e warm audio player executables there's my binary so I open that target and program so there's my device program so I can now disconnect my discovery board from my programming tool and now if I connect a micro USB cable Windows should automatically pick up a new memory stick drive so Windows has gone bing bong and it's now telling me you need to format the disk drive before you can use it and we want to say yes to that you now get a format disk screen from Windows so it's already recognized it's a 16 megabyte device it's fat by default and the sector size is 4096 which is correct for us if you're using Windows 10 uh, you might have to change some of these to make sure you can get the sector size as 4096 so we now go start yes we get the warning as always from Windows to go and format the drive so we have format complete so we can now close that and now we want to copy the audio file across to our nice new memory stick we had just gained in Windows you saw earlier we configured our two LEDs so as we copy the audio WAV file you should see the red LED come on when it is erasing the flash and the green LED will be lit when it is writing to the flash so back to our windows again so we can reduce that and reduce that so in our putting it all together folder we have an audio.wav file available so we want to copy that and we want to paste it onto our memory stick so mine was removable disk G so now you can see the red and green LEDs flashing on your board as this audio.wav file is copied across from your PC to the quad SPI flash on the discovery board so this depending on your PC this may take a few seconds possibly up to a minute or so to do the copy So there we go, the copy is complete, my green and red LEDs have finished flashing and Windows is now showing this WAV file on the removable disk G. And just to prove that it is there and does play, we will double click on it and Windows should then play it through the normal Windows media player. So 
there we go. So Windows is now playing the file, and you should be able to hear the guitar music playing on your laptop. So, so that completes the USB mass storage section of our diagram. So we've now finished section one or step one of our audio player.